Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, Angola's president's declared as the winner of last week's election. But accusations of fraud won't go away. Jao Lorenzo has handed a second term, but his rival has previously said that there are discrepancies in the count. Also, after months of mounting tensions, people in Tripoli fear a return of violence after dozens are killed over the weekend as rival militia clashed violently in the Libyan capital. And music, theatre, dance and film have been on offer at hundreds of shows across Tunisia this summer after the festival season returned with a bang following two unwelcome years of a pandemic pause. France 24's team is in the audience at the ancient Roman amphitheatre in El Gem. But first, Angola's president, Jao Lorenzo, has been re-elected for a second term after the Electoral Commission officially declared his ruling MPLA party the winner of last week's election. It officially got 51.17% of the vote, whilst the opposition UNITA party got 43 0.95%. Now, that's UNITA's best ever result. But its leader, Adalberto Costa Jr., has rejected them, saying that they don't match his coalition's own tally. Earlier, I asked Dr. Paolo Faria how all this is likely to affect João Lorenzo's mandate. I must uh, draw your attention for uh, the fact that uh, we really don't know whether uh, uh, John Lorenzo is going to have a mandate, uh, because as uh, things are going to are playing, you know, it seems to be that uh, there is a huge disagreement between the oppositions and on the other side, the incumbent political party, the AMPDA. So then, the mandate uh, currently, as things stands, really, the mandate of John Lorenzo is the mandate. Uh, attributed to him by the, the National Electoral Commissions is not the mandate that reflects uh, the will of the Angolan people. So, I mean, they, they, this is really the big, uh, uh, big uh, disagreement that uh, uh, we are facing uh, after the, uh, the, 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 the official announcement of results. Yeah. Do you think that the supporters of UNITA who were perhaps expecting uh, a, a win will accept the loss of their candidate and their, their party? Yeah, I mean, it's important also to say just two days after the general election took place, uh, we heard from uh, Adalberto Costa Jr., the, the main opposition party candidate from the, 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 the UNITA, the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. He said that uh, he does not, UNITA, his party and his coalition of parties then, does not accept uh, in, in whatsoever the result, preliminary results put out by the, the National Electoral Commissions. And uh, the, the, the argument is that for, for, to, for accepting the results, one should have an uh, objective ground uh, whereby the, the, the commission will draw you know, the data. Uh, but, you know, they did not present a substantial evidence uh, to back up, I mean, uh, the preliminary results. You know, that was actually the cracking point. You know, there is no acceptance if there is no uh, an objective indicators uh, to, to, to show the people, the Angolan people, that we are drawing our conclusion on that, on, uh, on the, the re result protocol or the minutes. So then, uh, and it, that's uh, what has been the big challenge for the National Electoral Commission to present the data to back up the result, really. And so far, fortunately, the, the National Electoral Commission has roundly failed, you know, to present substantial data indicators to, to, to back, you know, these uh, uh, fraudulent so far uh, results that uh, have been announced this afternoon. So Paula Faria there speaking to us about the National Electoral Commission's confirmation of Jao Lorenzo's win as uh, President of uh, Prime Minister of uh, Angola. Well, that is uh, it on that. We move now on to Libya, where people in Tripoli have been picking up the pieces after deadly clashes over the weekend. At least 32 were killed as rival militia battled in Tripoli following months 
of mounting political tensions. Laurent Berstecker talks us through. A political crisis that could escalate into a full-blown war. These images from the Libyan capital show the aftermath of Saturday's bloody clashes between warring militias, one supporting the internationally recognized National Unity Government and its leader Abdelhamid Dbeiba, the other allied with the rival administration led by Prime Minister Fatih Bashaha, based in the country's east. Both have accused each other of igniting the clashes, with Dbaiba lashing out at what he called putschists and foreign elements trying to topple him by force. The Tripoli-based prime minister also vowed to go after the culprits of Saturday's violence. We will prosecute all those involved in this brutal aggression, both military and civilian, those who took part in the fighting or provided support to militias. They will not escape punishment. Abdelhamid Dbeiba also said he would relocate the headquarters of some armed groups outside of Tripoli's city center. The announcement was largely well received in the capital, where residents were still reeling from the weekend's violence. What happened in the past two days in Tripoli is sad. People lost their cars and their belongings got burnt. Citizens no longer feel safe. We call on the government to impose control over these armed groups and to organize them so that they can be integrated into the Libyan army. Libya has been in crisis since 2011 uprisings that ousted longtime ruler Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. The country is now largely controlled by a multitude of armed groups with shifting allegiances. Well, Tuareg Berbers from communities across the Sahel headed to Kidal in northern Mali over the weekend for the Congress of the Movements of Azawad. That wrapped up on Monday. On the agenda were discussions about how best to merge political and military resources and cooperation after a ramping up of extremist attacks on Tuareg communities. Our correspondents sent us this report. More than a thousand people attended the Congress of Azawad, among them delegations from the Touareg Berber regions of northern Mali, as well as from Niger, Algeria, Mauritania and Libya. As extremist violence worsens, calls for a unified Touareg army have mounted. Leaders say this year more than 2,000 civilians have been killed by jihadists around Menaka alone. But there's been little outcry. There is a kind of carelessness, there is a kind of indifference, a lack of focus, if you like, on the part of the international community towards the suffering of these people. More and more civilians are fleeing the violence in the Manica region to take refuge in Kidal. The stronghold of the Tureg rebellion is now secured by the armed movements of Azawat. French forces left almost a year ago. The head of the town's security says their absence does not change much. There is no noticeable difference in the city, because in the past the French were involved in anti-terrorist missions and so on. They did not have an impact on the daily life of the people. We collaborate closely with the United Nations Peace Mission in Kidal, and we even have liaison officers. Our relationship with MINUSMA is good. In Kidal, cooperation with the United Nations is essential to security, but most of these fighters now also want a single armed movement. We've been working on this idea since 2014. We've united some movements while others have refused. We operate in the same areas, we have the same objectives. We're together politically and militarily. The growing insecurity in parts of the Sahel could hasten the unification of Mali and Tuaregs. Well, the summer festival season has ended in Tunisia. This year it was a corker after a two-year hiatus because of the pandemic. The last few months saw more than 250 events across the country offering up music, theatre, dance and film to festival goers keen on celebrating this chance to get together. Our team reports. European classical music and a Roman amphitheatre dating back to the 3rd century. At al Jem, the festival is an institution, having hosted international orchestras for more than 30 years. It thrills Tunisian audiences who discover other musical cultures. I really love it because of the magic of the place, the candlelight. We listen to classical music, it's soft, it's relaxing, 
and makes you forget about daily stress. This year, the festival is also celebrating the talents of young Tunisians, like the chorus members of the project Tunisia 88, which hopes to set up singing clubs in every high school and college. On the night of August 13th, they came from all different regions of Tunisia to sing lyrics celebrating National Women's Day, like Fatma, who comes from a club from Mednin in the south. It's really important for young people like me to have access to new things. For example, classical music. It's not necessarily for everyone, but at least we get a taste of it. This youthful spirit is also present in the seaside town of Klebia, where a week-long amateur film festival is held, one of the oldest of its kind in Africa. Personally, as a young person, I'm a regular here because each film talks about varied subjects and the society in which we live, without taboos. After the nighttime screenings, during the day, students attend open-air workshops. It's part of a volunteer initiative to encourage young people to express themselves, not just through film. We're trying to train young people, prepare them for life in all aspects, commitment, volunteering, group work. Training to support creativity in a country where young people who face high unemployment and economic crises still need to dream. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again if you can. Till then, take care.